Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the 7-Minute Podcast. Today's a little bit different. It's going to be special. I'm talking to an old uh, associate and co-worker who I've worked with. Wow, Eric, it's been over 15 years now. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, but I had a front row seat to his ascension, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Um, Eric Stone, he's the founder and CEO at Clear Path Ventures. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Formal, uh, formerly VP at Enterprise Holdings where we met, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. I was also on Enterprise Car Sales as well. Eric hired me. I don't even know, even know if he remembers interviewing me, but Eric actually hired me and um, almost didn't hire me because I had a pretty good resume. He said, you're not going to make a lot of money at this, but thank you so much because it was one of the best jobs of my life. Um, and it's give, it gave me an entrepreneurial spirit and it probably made me the person I am today. So Enterprise um, had a, a sweet spot in my heart. I like that. Um, most notably, the reason we're talking today is because Eric is the author of a new book just came out last week, um, well, this week probably, right? October 3rd, it was official. And, yeah, two days ago, the book is called Jumpstart Your Workplace Culture. And this really grabbed my attention because uh, workplace culture is, it's huge in America right now. And companies have discovered that workplace culture is more important than profit. All right. And that has become a really, really big thing. Um, Eric has over 30 years of experience in corporate America, that being with leadership as well. So how you doing, Eric? I'm doing great, Chris. It is so good to reconnect with old friends. Mm -hmm. uh, 100%. And, and it's funny, you mentioned, you know, the, the hiring process. And one thing I did probably, and it might have been right about your time, is I, I would always do a new hire lunch. And I think I started it probably about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. give or take. And what I used to do is I would write little stuff about, you know, family, hobbies, and things like that. And it's funny because now I'm reconnecting to people, but I saved my archived list. Right. And so I'd connect with a Chris, right? And I'd say, hey, do you know where you were March 2006? <laughs> and it was our lunch together, and I'd have little notes. But That's great awesome. Yeah, good, good. So um, workplace culture. So if you've been in corporate America for 30 years, then you know that corporations have come up with all these initiatives, and it's almost like the flavor of the month. One, one initiative is sexual harassment. Then the next one is diversity. Then DEI. And then, you know, all these different initiatives keep coming to corporate America and they become the buzzword of the month or the year for corporations. Now it's workplace culture. How do you get workplace culture to not just become a buzzword? People roll their eyes and go, okay, here we go again. What, what's the key to that? So, you know, I actually use a, a metaphor of an hourglass. Okay. In, in in the book. And and what it does, to your point, is it, it gets, well, let me explain it. So right on the top of an hourglass is really where you're kind of pulling information from your clients, your customers, your stakeholders, your board members, whoever it is, because you're always listening, observing, and learning of what's going on. And then as the hourglass will slowly come out, you're, you're really format formatting really a plan you know, a commitment in source of what are those three to five priorities that everybody in our organization is really going to focus on. And as the hourglass gets right to where the sand comes out is the clarity. That is the mission, vision, and values. It doesn't change. You're not going to be, uh, it stays very steady. So it's clear. And then when you have clarity, what ends up happening is the hourglass then goes out. And that's the reinforcement. That's the downloading of information, whether it's a entry-level manager meeting, a morning huddle, a quarterly uh, forecasting meeting, a mid-year forecasting meeting, a yearly retreat. And you're always talking about the same thing at every level. And so you can't keep just throwing new things that won't stick. And so right. I always use that mentality of let's keep it very simple. Let's look at those priorities. And But there's, of course, so much more. That's an approach to staying consistent. And then right when you think you got it, Chris, as we all know, a new right. technology happens, a pandemic. And you turn that hourglass over, and I use an hourglass, not an eyeglass. An hour, uh, hourglass is hour. We're getting everyone together versus it's one individual. Yeah. So that's a, a nice approach, but there's so much more that I'd love to go into with it. Did, did you trademark that or did you read that from somewhere else? The hourglass, <laughs> no. eyeglass. You, you know what? I'm not smart enough to trademark it. I, I, I need those visual things that allow, yeah. and I think people will really resonate to a simple approach, which was really what I tried to deliver with the book. That was good. So why is it important? Why is workplace culture important? It's important. Let me preface that with this. Um, 
as the generations change, and we talked about, you talked about five generations in one of your other interviews and the silent generation. I have to ask you about that later, <laughs> but um, different, different generations have different motivations. And what I'm noticing is this generation Z is about how fun is it to go to work? It, it's almost before comp compensation. I remember people said recognition and people like, don't you want to make money? Like, isn't money your, your motivator? I'm like, nope, I can make money. I just want to have a good time when I go to work and I want the culture to be good. So talk to me about what you've seen and why that's important. Well, as you mentioned, I mean, you have, you have these five generations. So each one of them have different values that are important to them. And each one of those generational perspectives are very important. They all bring something that's really vital to the organization. Mm -hmm. And it's just like when the millennials came in, you know, it was it was time is currency. You know, they wanted a little bit more time. They wanted that work-life balance that was really being pushed. And it made me as an operator better as long as I was listening and learning from the team. And so that allowed me and my team to schedule what we called with precision. We, we took the feedback and used what the millennials would bring. The Gen Z bring in, and I don't know if it's all Gen Z. I mean, I think they're getting a bad rap. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, hey, I, I'm a Michael Jordan person, you know, the newer generations love LeBron. I mean, you right. can't go wrong with either one of them. They both right. bring something that's really special. Mm -hmm. And so the Gen Z coming in, I do feel culture is unbelievably important to them. I don't think it's just about purpose and passion. I think that is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. I truly believe I live these five factors of engagement, Chris, that every generation really wants to be part of. And I okay. think with Gen Z, you know, they do want to have a relationship with their immediate supervisor. You know, that's really important to build that trust. And when you right. build that trust, you get great relationships. Relationships lead into results. Mm -hmm. They do want to have the ability to learn on the job. Yeah. You know, they do want that training and development and, and information in order to, you know, achieve that desired outcome that's out there. They want clear expectations of goals that they need to try to attain. They want to grow personally and professionally. Right. You know, they do want to be rewarded. It just might be different. It might be different from what we want. And so if you take all of those, I think Gen Z can bring a lot to the table. It's just a little different. And I think it's important corporations actually start doing some generational perspective training so we can understand what that other side of the table can bring. And that's, you know, another side note, there's something called reverse mentoring, okay. which a lot of people are talking about. And that is, that could be when a old man like me, you know, who, who has uh, been around a while actually gets coached by a junior level individual okay that might be someone from so i'm gen x maybe gen z and i'm actively learning and listening from their perspective and they can eventually do the same to me too but i've got to be able to understand what is important to them if we want to be successful right right so <clears throat> that's good stuff so what are the components you know of a strong workplace culture like i'm sure because you're hired people hire a clear path and go I need a tune-up. I need you to come into my company and consult. You go in there for your four or five days, observe, take notes. What type, What are the elements of a strong workplace culture? And then what are some of the elements where the, you find some weaknesses or some challenges? Yeah, I think the elements would be the, the starting point was, tell me about how you get people engaged. So, okay. so step one, it would be walking through each of those five factors that I kind of buzzed over fairly quickly. Because I want to get a good understanding of under each factor, I want to know the initiative that they're doing. For example, a relationship with their immediate supervisor or manager. T tell me about the employee journey. I come in, I interview, I then get onboarded. It's now month three, it's now month six, it's year one, it's year four. How does that look like? The other thing is there tends to be a lot of gaps in training. So you'll get someone who gets so frustrated, they just won't listen. I don't know what to tell them anymore. They just don't get it. And then I say, well, well, show me the training that you provide in that roadmap. And is it relevant? What are the gaps? So there tends to be some pretty big gaps that happen within some of the training that is really challenging for someone to then execute. 
you mentioned it, flavor of the week. It's, well, what are the priorities? I asked Chris, you tell me your five priorities. I asked Sarah and they're, they're completely different and they're supposed to be the same. Right. What are those key priorities? What are those policies and procedures that are very complicated, very clunky, not allowing people to truly execute greatness? And so those are, it usually isn't too, too complicated. So those are a couple of key things that I always start with. That's good. That's good. So I, I, I worked for a real estate broker at one point and um, they asked me to come in and do agent development and, um, and, and, and recruiting that they were kind of one ball of everything together. And when I asked the leader, what, what's the goal? He said, Chris, people jump around in real estate all the time from company to company because they, it's like a me too. Like you're not doing anything different. So it's all about how I can be compensated or what, what I can get from that company. He said, my goal is to be the company that no one ever leaves or doesn't want to leave. What, that, and that takes culture. How do you create an environment where people don't want to leave? The, the biggest key is going to be, you know, I feel it starts on the relationship side. Uh, but, but so there's a stat with Gallup and I think it says, well, first of all, the, the number one people reason people leave is because of their relationship with their immediate supervisor. If their supervisor is disengaged, they are seven times more likely to leave. And so, you know, I think I always try to keep it simple. Well, if the statistics are telling us that, if there's companies who've done research that tell us why people leave and those reasons why they leave, well, then let's let's start talking about how we build it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's one of the big reasons. What was really difficult as I was starting to climb the, the, the corporate ladder was really understanding that even if I was bringing my absolute A game, I was so removed from sometimes that day-to-day -day operation, it would kill me when people would leave. And so you can do these exit interviews or stay interviews you know, along the way to, 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 to get the pulse of things. And after hiring you know, thousands of people and losing way too many employees that I care to admit as a team, the common theme in these exit interviews or stay interviews comes down to, you know, that relationship piece. And like I said, is, is, is maybe I was really good at what I was doing, but I was, I, I just didn't see the employee enough. And so I really right. counted on the greatness of Chris Wright to be able to breathe mm -hmm. that special thing yeah. where they really want to run through a wall for you mm -hmm. and they can balance you know, I like to say is the, the really good organizations balance empathy with accountability. Right. They they balance high character mm -hmm. with high standard. Yeah. Um, and so it goes right back to relationships. I mean, I hate to make it too simple, but that no, that's good stuff. Makes people want to stay, and it hurt me because I'm like, well, wow, I I really have to, and I, and I learned I have to depend and coach and train and develop my team to be able to create those special relationships. But, oh, so recognize effort, but reward excellence. And that's what yeah. we all have to do. And I think culture gets a bad rap. I think yeah. it sometimes <laughs> is misunderstood. It is, it is thought of just hugs, high fives, rousing speeches. There is so much more to it. It is, uh, and, and that's why engagement is truly a catalyst to culture. Engagement truly, Engaged employees truly create a business outcome that's a positive. So I like to keep it real simple. Awesome, awesome. So what what's the role of leadership and what's the role of the employee to maintain that ecosystem? I mean, I think it starts with someone like Chris Wright. I mean, when you're going to live your values, you're going to ensure that your behavior is aligned with your company values and there are no gaps. Mm -hmm. For example, if in fact customer service is really important to me and I am going to promote someone who doesn't live up to those standards, that's a problem. I've just deflated everything that I'm trying to do. And so you have to live the values of what you have brought. Everyone lists them. They just don't always live them. And so the moment you go a little off course, people are allowed to second guess. Mm. The thing that ripples through an organization more than anything, Chris, is gossip. Mm. And the hardest thing to communicate sometimes is the message you really need communicated. And so you have to be mindful of all of those, all of those things. Which goes back to your ABC. Right. Well, do you have something called the ABC or something like that? Right. 
So, so there's there's the ABC. So I use ABCs on a communication standpoint. Okay. So, so for explain communicating that. information. So A is you got to amplify that message. Mm -hmm. And so when information comes out and we're doing something really exciting, it's a pay raise. It's a, a fun new technology. Right. It's something exciting. You know that is poster boarded on the back of your shirt it's on the wall it's i mean it's everywhere it's email it's conference call it's a town hall it's always amplified great organizations know when to amplify the message conversely for the b great organizations know how to buffer that message okay. so they know how to take that really long-winded thing or that complex thing and really synthesize it to a very short passage and pass that along i've had a lot of things that you know, someone wanted us to definitely do, but it was really confusing. And mm -hmm. I felt if we could shorten it, addition by subtraction is what I write about, right. kind of the hourglass, right? That clarity moment, mm -hmm. it tends to take hold. And it is not that flavor of the week that you mentioned. Yeah. And then the C is convey. You know, there are times in the organization, I call them the, the did you knows, those ESPNers, mm -hmm. where, you know, whether it's just you're conveying in an email, you're conveying on your project management system that you might use. So it's the ABCs of some of those things. But leadership's role, it starts with leaders. The folks who are really doing a lot of the hard work have to also, what I call, become culture carriers. So great organizations find ways to get, and I had the Chris Wrights of the world, mm -hmm. who would take everything we're about and communicated almost being the voice of the organization. It meant much more when Chris Wright said it than when Eric Stone said it. That, and so that's true. Your role was tremendous. And so they are to become those culture carriers. And I always say the beauty of culture is it really is a shock absorber for the tough times. And we all have them. We are all gonna go home and have rough, rough days. And it is a shock absorber that allows you to handle that the, the, the tenseness, the stress, the anxiety, that mental health well-being that you want to have. Right. And my goal is always that when Chris Wright went home or Sarah Jones went home, mm -hmm. I wanted her to at least hopefully have learned something today. So even if he or she had a tough day, they would learn something new. And when they went to mom or dad or grandpa or grandma or whoever they were with, whatever significant other, whomever it was, that it wasn't always negative. It was, wow, I learned something new and it was something special. And that's what culture is also allowing everyone to do is come together mm -hmm. to a common goal to achieve something really special for a sustained period of time. I mean, Chris, my parents, I'm sure wondered, Eric, I, I, you went to school to rent cars? It doesn't sound that glamorous. And Especially when education is so expensive. <laughs> you know yeah. what you're doing? <laughs> If, if I can, I don't know your, your audience or who this goes to, but I yeah. will say one Everybody. big nugget, mm -hmm. especially for Gen Z, okay. uh, is passion can be developed. Let me say that again, right? Passion can be developed. I, I, like I said, I did not go to school for a rental car master's degree. Right. I found that I liked business and I found companies who would treat me right and allow me to grow in that opportunity. And I mm -hmm. stayed loyal. And the other piece of advice is just give it some time. Yeah. Just give it a little time. You're going to have really bad days. But if you look, Chris, at your biggest accomplishments, and I say, Chris, matter of fact, if I ask you, Chris, tell me, tell me outside of probably some family stuff, what's your biggest business accomplishment? I, I bet whatever you'll tell me took a lot of hard work and it was not. It was not easy. That's right. what makes it special. And that's I, another message I'd love to give to individuals is kind of hang in there. I, you know, it's funny you say that because um, when I when I accepted the enterprise job, I, I had interviewed probably with, you know, 10, 12 com companies. This was the days of career builder. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, it was not compensation wise. It wasn't the best opportunity. But when I looked around me, I thought if I stay here three to five years, it's going, it's almost like a master's degree. And I thought the culture was amazing. And, and then I, you know, I met you, you were amazing in the interview. And I said, I want to work with that company. I'm, I'm going to have to rearrange my lifestyle economically for a little while. But that's what drew me to the company was that I saw people who were still there or people who had left. And I asked others who, had, have you worked at Enterprise? They go, oh yeah, great company. I worked there for four years or five years. And um, it set me up for where I am today. 
So yeah, kudos to that, that company. That I don't know if they're still doing the great things they did back in the early 2000s. I hope so. But um, that's, that's a testament to um, what they did. Um, let's talk about ClearPath, if you don't mind. You're a consultant. Does that mean that you pretty much go into companies and do this type of thing that we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's really two. Well, there's three things really that, that that we do. So, so number one is working, and what I love to do is that one-on-one -on -one coaching. So, working with somebody who is trying to navigate their path, and so it usually is someone in leadership who is either trying to kind of bring their level up or bring their team's level up. And so, there's that individual component of that one-on-one -on -one conversation of what are some of those things that stand in the way. Hence, clear path, right? What are the things we can move aside to create a clear path? For the organizations themselves, it's kind of what we discussed earlier. It is really getting a good look under the hood mm -hmm. and trying to find out what are some of those challenges through the hourglass approach. Really, I kind of use an hourglass approach to it, as I was uh, talking about earlier. The thing, especially with the book that I'm doing a lot of upcoming, is, is speaking engagements similar to, to what you'll do is you know reaching out to organizations about engaging their workforce and that's mm. probably been the most popular thing right now is with the book coming out and it being such a hot topic is having an opportunity to speak in front of uh, leadership yeah. and talk about engaging your workforce but but really reshaping what people think workplace culture is i think again i think it can be misunderstood right so when you walk into a company he said, okay, let me see your core values and let me see your mission statement. And they go, huh? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Do you help them develop that? Like sit down with the leadership and says, oh, well, first thing we need to do, because you said behaviors, um, you said behaviors and values and how they correlate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what I, I could do that. I, I They need to do that, yes. you know? And so, so my role would really be to say, Okay, so your behaviors are about uh, teamwork or customer service, whatever it may be. What are the behaviors that you are demonstrating and you would expect to follow suit? I always use a good example of working with an organization, customer service was struggling. And here would be a good example. Okay, Going into the peak season, customer service is struggling. And we kind of take a look, step one, let's see what is going on. What are the trends? What are the data? What does all that show me? And they felt it was really just this mindset, this attitude we were not demonstrating. And you might have, if you've listened to some of my talks, heard yes. the story about Johnny the Bagger. Oh, yes. And yeah, that was a good we, one, by the way. We, we took the story of Johnny the Bagger, who was a, he has a young man who was uh, just, as he would say, I was just a bagger. But long story short, he goes, listens to a inspirational speech by a consultant who comes in to a grocery store chain and is trying to create a better customer experience, increase engagement and loyalty. And long story short, Johnny at first didn't know what he could do. And so Johnny then goes home and decides he's going to come up with a thought of the day. And he tells that to the consultant. He calls her and says, you know, first, I, I had no idea what I was going to do. How, how am I going to do this? I'm just a bagger. And long story short, a couple of weeks after he does this initiative of the thought of the day, his line is all the way down the frozen food section. And the manager comes in and they are panicking because they, it's, oh no, people are going to wait, trying to triage. And the customers say, don't worry, I, I'm, I'm here waiting for Johnny's thought of the day. And uh, someone all the way back in the frozen food section says, no, I used to come here once a week. Now I come here every time I'm in the area because I'm waiting for Johnny's thought of the day. That's awesome. And so it then transforms the entire workplace. The Now the floral department decides that they want to follow Johnny's lead to put their personal signature on every interaction. And they are using unused corsages or bro broken flowers. And they are going to go and they're going to pin it on a young child or an elderly individual mm. to make their day. And so the long story short is, well, we said, well, wow, that's a great story. Transforms everything. Mm -hmm. How can we get that within the within the workplace if we're struggling in service? And if it's one of your core values, what do we need to do? Well, that becomes a new higher orientation video to explain what the behaviors should be like. Right. That then goes into the training program of how to be a Johnny the Bagger. They then reward that behavior by having a monthly Johnny the Bagger award. Wow. It mirrors the value. 
And so when I say simplicities or what you do within a company, that's a simple, easy way to just put everything in. It's very simple. It's clear. And so I wouldn't do the do the mission, vision, values as much as how are you living them? What are the behaviors you're trying to do? Mm-hmm. And so that would be like a long winded story of what you could do to make it very easy with a company. Right, right, it right. certainly get more challenging than that, but that would be what you would do for a company. It might be a sales process. You know, it could be policies and procedures. What do we got to take a look at? Like I said, gaps in training are a biggie, but. Oh, now do you have a book in front of you? I do. Give me a second. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. I'm going to, I'm I'm actually going to put this on the podcast as well, but I just wanted to, people to see the cover. Yeah. So, and before you tell us about the book, I'd like you to give us the cliff notes of it. And, but I also want you to talk about road trip as well. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the road trip uh, is, is the metaphor in the book. And so when I was trying to make a decision to share a message, and that's why I wrote the book, I wanted to share a message that I felt could impact people. I wanted to find ways to unlock people's potential. It gets so disappointing when you hear people hating what they do Mm -hmm. and they go home and they're frustrated and stressful. And so long story short, I decide I create this road trip metaphor about culture because it is a bit of a journey. You don't do it in three days. You don't change your organization's culture. It takes time. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted something that would help land some of the messages throughout and have a little fun with it. And so, for example, to recap the chapter, it says in the rearview mirror, you know, and so all little things that go along, there's a couple of roadside attractions for kind of a different way to potentially look at it. So I wanted to have a bit of a metaphor. So that is the that road trip theme. Okay. So let's talk about the book. You bet. So the, the the Cliff Notes version would be, you know, what do organizations do? What can leadership do to create something quite special where everyone is swimming in that same direction and you are trying to achieve a common goal and that usually leads to sustained excellence. And I was always fascinated with that. Why, why do the New England Patriots in their day or certain organizations, why do they just find ways to attract, retain, and advance a diverse workforce and continually perform at the highest of level, creating great experiences and a great environment? And oh, I, th- so- I thought that was just Tom Brady. That was, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought he was the answer to all that. But go ahead. I, I bet you. That's, that's a good, that's fair, fair point. So... <laughs> That's, you know, that is the, the, the quickest version of what's within it. But it goes from, hey, how do I hire for match? So if I'm starting, you know, trying to bring in people, how do I hire for match versus fit? And it's a little semantics, but when I think of fit, I use the example I've used several times of a shoe. Mm. You know, I'm looking for a size eight. I wear a size eight. That's all I'm going to get. But, but a match is a little bit different. You know, how do you truly try to find a match? So while fit is maybe the head. Mm-hmm. Match is that tie, if you're going to use clothing, right? The tie makes everything stand out, the shirt, the pants, mm-hmm. the shoes, whatever it may be. You want people to add in addition to. You want them to build off of. You want diversity of thought and a whole bunch of other things. Hiring is a piece of that. A lot about training on behavior. So I don't know why corporations aren't trying to give more behavioral training and how do you create this training culture? So there's a hiring component, a training component, an additions by subtraction theory that goes through it. Because as you said, flavor of the week just doesn't work. It just gives another excuse of why I'm not going to do it because it's not going to last until next Thursday. Why am I going to believe in it? I think what really separates it is there is a assessment of how do you measure culture? And so when you would ask and say, Chris, how does your organization measure culture? You tend to hear crickets at times, or you might put your eggs into an engagement basket. And that is really, really important too, where you do a survey or a pulse survey. Yeah. But I came up with, speaking of a road trip, a six point inspection of how you would try to measure an organization's health of their culture. Mm-hmm. And so from hiring to training, to a clear, consistent message, a practical book that is not theoretical. And that was my goal. I think the the, the best part is a way to uh, assess it, assess where you are, a baseline. Do you think this is your first of book of many or, or was this a passion project? That's a great question, Chris. This was really hard for me 
to do. Uh, I, I mean, I, it, it wasn't just my business experience. It was interviewing countless of people who were great at what they do, who were thought leaders, who were senior executives of Fortune 500 companies. So I have so much respect for anybody who writes a book. Um, it, it, it was a passion project because I, I am all in on this. Yeah. And I might start, maybe I start doing something with this jumpstart theme, maybe jumpstart your career and, you know, who knows what's next, but well, you know, I that's don't the, know. That's the thing, you know, guys like Simon Sinek, they were like, you know, a, a, a publisher would say, well, you got a five book contract. He'll go, okay, find your why, start with why, why in your business. And it's always about the why, but you could write five books on the same subject just in, in different avenues. Um, I also have a book called The Morning Miracle. Then he has The Morning Miracle for Real Estate Agents and The Morning Miracle for Accountants and how he changes it each time uh, based on the profession. Um, quick question, because you brought up something when you were telling me about the book. What's your feeling on personality assessments? Uh, yeah, well, I've obviously used them. Matter of fact, we used them. I know when I was on uh, several different boards for senior level positions, mm -hmm. um, I think they bring a good perspective. I think there's not one thing I would always use. It's very similar to the questions I had. While I had a list of questions that I might ask to get a good understanding of what I felt would be how I can make a good decision for my team on bringing someone in, I don't know if I leave it all to one. I think those are things to me that will help guide if I'm on the right track or not. Okay. And so I found a lot of value because before maybe five years ago, I wasn't really using them. And then by being part of uh, some senior level positions we were filling, I learned a lot from it. And I think there's a lot of value to it. Okay. I just think there's not, it's not like I just was mentioning that there's three questions I ask and that's, and that's it. Yeah. You know, to me, it's like this pie chart with anything. And, you know, maybe questions are 50% of it and some yeah. character pieces and then past behaviors. Mm -hmm. And then disc assessment is is certainly something there. So I kind of put it all together. Yeah, the reason I ask is because I think you, you talked about the size eight and the match and where personality assessments can get, in, get a leader into trouble is finding the right spot to do them. Do I interview him first? And then I use an assessment to validate what I saw in the interview or do I do the assessment first, but then I'm going to have preconceived ideas or expectations with, of what I'm going to find in this person. So it's where you do it. Some people even do the assessment after the offer has already been made. You know what? You're a great person, great interview. Now let me do an assessment to see where you're going to fit in our company or how I can learn about you best. You know, listen, it allows you, you get more data. And, yeah, and I think that would data. probably be the way to do it. And mm -hmm. to me, it was, oh, yeah. That, 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 that does make sense based on the answer of this. Yeah. I remember so, the days that people would do an assessment and be like, oh, he's not a fit, rip up his application, I'm done. And I was yeah. like, that was the wrong way to do it because people just don't assess well. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I spent so much time mm -hmm. on the hiring process. So I, I would usually do the, the, the third and final, mm -hmm. but, but for that second, which was a senior position was still doing it, I would would not only I, I would observe. I mean, I always wanted to see I wanted to understand because I think if you don't ask a good clarifying question in the interview process, you can you can go to your halo and horn effects, as they say, <laughs> you can have your your assumption. Yeah. And I think that's not fair. And I made plenty of mistakes in the beginning. And I'm yeah. sure I, I turned down some really good people and I'm ashamed of it. I'm sure I just wasn't ready. Yeah. But it is it is an art and a science. And I spent a lot of time observing, understanding, are they truly following up? And it was so hard because you're just, you, you know, you're there as a, an individual and I really didn't want to say anything throughout the process. And I'm hoping they're going to ask a follow-up question. So I put a lot of training and coaching into that. And then we always had to be careful because when we would make our final decision, they would sometimes want to know what my impression was. It's kind of like the disc thing, you know, well, I want to use your expertise and it would be like, yeah. tell me, it would be Chris, tell me your thought process. What made you think that way? What were some of the questions you might've asked? Right. And so it's kind of being careful with the disc assessment mm -hmm. versus also sometimes following up on the interview through your team. Well, Eric, you know, you, um, we're going to end here, but you, you've been the leader of some amazing people. Uh, some people call Enterprise Rent a Car a cult. <laughs> there's there's like memes and funny videos, and there's culturally like we're all still such close friends. 
families, family, friends. We know each other's children. You know, I'm still in touch with a lot of people. I just called Brenda Boya the other day. I, oh, yeah. I got a friend. I got a friend looking for a car. I need. They need your help. You know, so we just are always connected. We still talk to Jen Sutton over in Australia. That, you know, so there's just so many people that we still stay connected to. And it was a time I think in all of our lives. Um, and I think that that's because uh, we were under really good leadership. Uh, by the way, me and Greg Widelak, our daughters play softball together. So. Okay. I, I'm just, I, I, I keep talking about these things because enterprise just never leaves our lives. It's like always there. Um, I attributed that a lot of that to you because you were great at team building. You did a lot of really, really good things when you were in leadership. And um, that's why whenever your face pops up in social media, everyone's like, click, 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 like, 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 because, <laughs> you know, you're someone I think we all want to support. So jumpstart your workplace, right? That's the name of the book. Love the artwork, by the way, the coffee cup. I need a cup after this interview. And <laughs> yes, jumpstart your workplace culture and um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Amplify, Amazon, right? Barnes and Noble, Amplify. Yeah, and, um, it was it was really fun connecting again, Chris. Yes, sir. We need to make sure we stay in touch. We 100%. definitely had something quite special thanks to people like you. I hope this episode is going to help. I'm certainly accessible all the time on LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, thanks to my daughter, by the way, who, who yeah, really yeah. helps get me in shape. So one of the things I do plan to do with this is that, you know, when I hear someone talking about it or speaking about it, hey, watch this interview, get in touch with Eric. So it'll definitely be, definitely be a referral piece as well. That's great. Really awesome. enjoyed it. Really All right. Enjoyed thanks, it. man. I will talk to you later. Enjoy the rest of your day. You bet. I right, Take care, buddy. Bye. Bye.